Welcome to the 2020 Awards Podcast. Today we're going to be taking a look back at Clint Eastwood's Oscar Award winning film, Unforgiven. I ain't gonna never breathe again, ever. Now he's dead. And the other one, too. All on account of pulling the trigger. It's a hell of a thing killing a man. Take away all he's got, and all he's ever gonna have. The 2020 Awards is an annual event that uses the advantage of time and perspective to revisit the films from two decades earlier. With the benefit of hindsight, a voting body of film industry professionals from around the world elects either new or previous nominees and hosts a live awards ceremony designed to both honour and offer new perspective on the impact of this body of work on cinema itself and its influence on our culture. Hi, I'm Chris Christensen, President and Co-Founder of the 2020 Awards, and I'll also be your host for today's podcast. Uh, we have a very special guest with us today, uh, filmmaker and author Brian McDonald. Brian is one of my oldest and dearest friends. Isn't that right, Brian? That's totally true. Yeah. Um, we've collaborated on a number of uh, projects together, including his award-winning short film, Whiteface, and we wrote and produced a feature film together called Inheritance. Uh, but more in recently, Brian has broken out on his own, breaking away from me. <laughs> I don't know what made you want to do that, but anyway, Brian has... Uh, Brian has actually recently been, you've been working as a story consultant at Pixar and Disney. After the success of your two books on storytelling, Invisible Ink, and The Golden Theme, both of which are available at Amazon, and they're fantastic books, and I encourage anybody who cares about story at all to pick up a copy of both. Uh, we're also joined today by uh, 2020 Awards Vice President Daniel J. Cork Esquire. How you doing? And our producer and engineer, Lee Christofferson, here at Wonderbread Studios. Hey, thanks for coming by, guys. If you're a film industry professional and would like to join the voting syndicate, please contact us through our website, which is 2020awards.org. That is 2020awards.org. And uh, let's get on with the show. So uh, why don't we recap the movie? Danny, what do you got you for us? me to do this? Yeah, you got to do uh, something. Clint Eastwood is a retired gunman in the Old West who finds himself lured back into the business when a prostitute is cut up by a couple of cowboys who uh, find a bounty placed on their heads. So, uh, Ryan, had you seen this before? I had seen it when it came out, not in the theater, but I saw it uh, when it came out on the VHS. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and that's, yeah, so I saw it when it was new, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And what was your what was your recollection of it? Uh, I remembered almost nothing. Yeah. Except I was building a house. That's all I remember from the movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remembered nothing else, yeah. really. Um, except the opening scene of uh, the sunset and the silhouetted thing. That's all I remembered. Right. Um, I, think, I think I remembered more than that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but... Uh, did you see it in the theater? I actually did see it in the theater, yeah. So did I. Yeah. What, what was your reaction to it back then? Uh, I was a teenager. I was like 18 or 19. So um, You don't have to brag. I was bored, I think, <laughs> when I saw it originally in yeah. the theater. Danny, where did, what was uh, your... I also saw it on the VHS. Um, I was not bored. I remember a lot more because I've seen it, I think, a lot more sort of in between then and now. Yeah. Um, I remember thinking it was a very slow-paced Western and it wasn't... It was a Western that was kind of like about something more. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. So I remember, you know, it was it was definitely sort of um, targeting the issue of violence. But as a kid, being you know, in a, growing up in a you know pop culture that's saturated in that, I didn't quite. It didn't resonate with me right. until I was much older. So uh, yeah, I liked it a lot more, and I liked it then. But I liked it a lot more this time. I didn't. I didn't actually like it back then. Yeah, but I. But uh, I wanted to like it, and everybody <laughs> said it was good. Yeah. And so I was like, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I liked it. You know, I just said it to be part of the club in a way. Yeah. I thought it must be good, and I'm missing something. Right. Um, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it, and I was, I was pretty bored. Yeah. Most so. people won't admit that. I think, I don't know, like, I, I think it's a bold thing. Like, I don't know. I, I think I've been guilty of that. But I think it's. A, I think people are afraid to say that. To say, yeah, I, I was true. going. I wanted to like it, and everybody else seemed to like it. And you know, 
maybe there's something wrong with me if I don't like it you know yeah mm-hmm. that's been my way with most French cinema <laughs> French New Wave yeah I'm with you on the French New Wave <laughs> I'm like I guess it's good and now I'm like no I, life is too short for Godot uh, <laughs> life is too short for Godot sorry <laughs> Godot is or never going to really. arrive so yeah um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Life short, too short for Godard, and um, I don't know Truffaut. Yeah, I'll take or leave it. The colorblind casting is interesting because I did like that. Did you like that? I'm not a big fan of colorblind casting, and I used to not care. I used to think, well, whatever. That's kind of good. It's nice to see, you know, people of color working or whatever. Yeah. But then uh, August Wilson used to talk about colorblind casting, and he said that it wasn't. Uh, he really hated it. And I started thinking about it after that. And there is something about it. it you, when you do that, you're not being specific to the experience of what, what is the experience of being a black person in the West at that time? What is right. that experience? Yeah. If you're not being specific to it, then you're kind of lying about it. Like, nobody yeah. would ignore that this is a black dude with a gun. Right. You know what I mean? Who was yeah. an assassin. Nobody would ignore that shit. I think that people think that that's, that is the high road is to ignore it. Um, but I don't think that's the high road. I think that's the easy road to ignore it. As if, because being, I mean, I don't want to get into all this whole thing, but being a person of color gives you a perspective that you can't, you can't get away it's, from. It's annoying when they ignore it. It's even more annoying when, and I'm going to cite two examples, uh, The Patriot and the show Hell on Wheels, where the protagonist, the, the producers seem to be so concerned with this character being likable that they say they paid their slaves or they paid their work. Oh, right. That <laughs> one drives me crazy. <laughs> that right. one drives me crazy. It's like, why can't... I mean, there are movies that... I mean, I think... Uh, I'm trying to think of movies like Master and Commander, maybe, which sort of didn't disregard the class system or how people of, you know, different races were considered by um, sort of the admiralty at the time. Uh, they don't shy away from that yet. You know, it's, it's too... I think they're so worried about um, what the audience is going to think. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just... It, it just seems cowardly to me. But in this particular movie, there wasn't really that a lot of room to do that. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it just seemed like Gene Hackman regarded outlaws as scum and he kind of treated them with equal disdain so I didn't feel like there was really a, an opportunity for that to happen Clint Eastwood was obviously friends with the guy right. so how, many, how much interaction was there maybe from the kid I don't know but well I was going to say maybe the kid right like he seems like he wouldn't have been so willing to go along with I mean he's already kind of being brought in to share half the money with he was Clint more Eastwood about the money that- right so it's like sidekick was and it seemed to me like if anybody he would be sort of like well, look I'm not giving half of my right. I mean, money to like right, someone that's, that's fair that's fair and it doesn't have to be so it doesn't have to even be confrontational it's just weird to not deal with it at not all. deal with it at all yeah. yeah yeah. you know I mean people could have been fine with it like, like I did think certainly this is going to come up later in the film right, right. and it never does and, and by that time I was just sort of going the film or going with it so right. it never really became was that true of Wild Wild West as well <laughs> no but I never enjoyed that film oh, so I, yes. <laughs> and I, I like Morgan Freeman more than I like Will Smith sure I'll admit what? that <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, Brian, you mentioned that, I don't know if you, you were saying that, I mean, we were talking about the Emperor Has No Clothes Syndrome. Yeah. Do you think that is that applies to this film? Well, you know, I, I don't think I've ever liked a Clint Eastwood movie, um, a movie that he's directed. And uh, I, I often want him to cut. Like, I often, like, I'm watching, I go, you can cut now. You can cut now. You can cut now. They're always way longer than they need to be. Um, having said that, this is my favorite <laughs> of his movies. I feel like it's less like that. Um, uh, so I don't get. I don't get it. I don't get the appeal. I don't know why people think he's good. I don't get it. I never have, and uh, I tried to. Like I said, I tried to play along with everybody and go, "Yeah, it's good." But at the same time, I was like, "I don't think I believe that," you know. Um, but I'm often the guy who doesn't like things, and so sometimes I get tired of being that guy. I don't think he's. Would What's you that just, like? I don't, yeah. <laughs> Let's draw a distinction between the film being having the emperor have no clothes and Clint Eastwood being the emperor. Uh, you know. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think that okay, the emperor himself, I mm-hmm. think, is buck naked. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I, well, not you know what? 
He's one of the Speedos. He's not <laughs> completely butt naked. Uh, we do everything we can. <laughs> <in analogy. laughs> um, you know, I mean, yeah, I, he's he's okay. But I don't think he's great, and I don't know where that's coming from. Um, there seems to be something with critics if something is slow enough and ponderous enough that it must be good or it must be smart. Um, they do that a lot. They, Maybe in an era of very flashy, you know, fast-paced Michael Bay. Uh, I think that's film. always been that's always been that's always been true. Yeah, yeah. The slower, the more boring, the more intelligent it's supposed to be or it's perceived to be, um, and not just slow and boring. Um, I, I don't know why that think is. Think of Godard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you'll get what he's saying. Um, um, I don't know. Maybe we should get into why we like it then, and why I yeah. don't know. Like, because I mean, I'll make my case for it, and okay. I think I think it's a I think it's a really good western. I think it's a really good movie. I think it's the last for me. What's what makes it so good is it seems like the last chapter in you know the great book of westerns, and I've always felt like every western that's come out since has just, it's just kind of gone with a whimper because I thought this was, it was kind of dismantling everything uh, that we've been sort of taught um, about the American West, the mythology of the American West. Um, and it kind of turns it on its head in this very revisionist, and I mean that in, not in a pejorative way, mm -hmm. like a, a kind of um, taking all those John Wayne ideas and there's, you know, the... the well, the original... Clint Eastwood movies too oh, yeah yeah I think he's Great playing with his own mythology um, I think thematically it's very powerful now um, how it's executed I think maybe there's some you know kinks in there it's maybe a little over long but I think the way it plays out um, I don't know I think those themes come across without necessarily banging you over the head with it um, I like that the hero is kind of the villain and vice versa um, the sheriff is the bad guy and you know but, but is he I mean yeah well it's just it well, I forces you to ask those questions he is, but is he really the bad guy he tried to kind of diffuse the situation right if he were the From protagonist the I don't think he would be the well, bad I th guy I think he's got this he's trying to keep order and he's got this killer coming to town uh, these killers coming to town I mean it's it's basically by virtue of the fact that of the way he handles the thing in the first the first 10 minutes, I think that he's really villainous. You know, he, he basically... But isn't that just what the times were? I think that's that's fair. Yeah, I think you could say that. I don't even I mean, think I'm it's not just that. I think, I think it actually goes down to, like... One of the things I, I definitely remember from this movie is my allegiance shifting. Well, the first time I saw it, my allegiance shifting from character to character, going like, oh, I guess this is the hero. Oh, I guess this is the hero. And it, what I liked about it is I found that everybody was gray. And that I found as a very attractive concept. And, and even to this day, I still think it's nice that, that cool. I understand Gene Hackman's motivations. He, he's like, he wants justice, but he's just sort of like, I'm trying to keep the peace in my town. He just wants to build his house. He wants to retire. He just wants to build his he house and retire. Yeah. He, yeah, but what you're talking about with gray areas, I think that's particularly powerful in a western because I don't think because you always have the white hat, you yeah, have the white exactly, hat, black hat, black hat. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know. I just think this does a very good job of it of of talking also about mythology itself. So you have certain stories grow in the telling. So you know how the the hooker is cut up, and then it's like they cut her breasts off and her fingers off, and the kid has this sort of own. Uh, he's built up this story around himself like he, he thinks he's such a badass and, right. and there's this guy well, the following the book is where like the woman didn't understand why her daughter right I think that it's character. a different beat I think that's a more... legend that he was right and, and the, the guy that's following um, uh, English Bob and sort of riding his myth um, and then you have the guy that's the truth you've got Clint Eastwood who's this he's this outlaw but it's not romantic in any sense, and he doesn't like beat his chest about his uh, his his history. And if anything, he doesn't talk about it and doesn't. I mean, the one story is like the kid says to him, "You faced on two men," and he doesn't want to talk about it. Then Morgan Freeman says to him later on, "Wasn't that three men?" And he's like, "I'm not that guy anymore." But he clearly is still that guy. Oh, if yeah. you find the people by their actions, he's always been that guy. And I think that's it's particularly interesting. Like if you see they're trying to deny who they are throughout the whole film. There's a guy that's, um, he's basically a brute, but he's trying and failing to be a carpenter. You've got a guy that's a killer, 
and he's trying and failing to be a hog farmer and the kid is trying to be an outlaw and he's really not cut out for it there are all these people he's a total poser right right right. but there are all these people trading off of things or trying to trade off the things that they clearly are not naturally it's like is the movie all by itself is it working like I don't care what John Ford did or what Sergio Leone did right or whatever what is this movie doing so this movie all by itself this story all by itself speaking of context and just talking about the movie the context Mm -hmm. just within the framework of the movie um, I felt like here's this guy he's a retired gunman and um, gunslinger well gunslinger is a Hollywood term at the time they would have said gunman or shooter all right or shootist (laughs) 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 he's a he's a killer Right, that turned into but around. but <laughs> people talked about him being a killer, and he talked about like when I watch like the behind the scenes stuff, it's like he's a poor farmer. It's like oh really? I didn't actually know that he was a poor farmer. I I that looked like pioneer stuff that I always see, and it looked really normal, and it looked like like nothing. Like I didn't see that his kids were hungry. I, I didn't just see think about it. Right. His kids look fun. Right, and so it's like, what made this guy go do this to, if he promised his dead wife that he was going to be something else? And I felt like the thing that drove the movie, the story, wasn't there. So I didn't care what happened afterwards because I didn't believe a guy who promised his dead wife that he wouldn't do this anymore. Well, that's a good point. Kids. I think that's a, that's you, a real... You, I, you, confer, you that, for me, it, there's, there's definitely something... Like some people after the screening when we saw it were talking about... But we didn't see that he was a gunslinger, a killer, and 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 for me, I kind of thought like it was kind of okay. Well, I think there is. This is going back to the context, but but I think there was. I kind of liked that he was bumbling and couldn't get on his horse. Right. And was falling oh yeah, I loved mud. all that stuff. Right, right. Doesn't that say enough though? And then the the, the knowledge of a thousand dollars, and that this is this guy's real trade. He trades in killing. We know well, he's good at What I was going to say is I, I feel like there was something that wasn't quite selling me and I think that's what it is. Because it's the old thing, right? It's an old story. This is not, there's nothing new about this story. It's the guy who was in the gangs or whatever, the gangster who's trying to go, back in. Yeah, yeah, the guy who's trying to go yeah. straight, right? And so you can't make that guy like there's no dramatic stakes if he just goes thousand bucks let's go yeah. and he has to you know all I saw that changed his mind was he fell down chasing a pig in the mud and he's like well they did say that like there was two of the pigs fell ill right so it yeah. seemed but like, he should okay, have no pigs that's you know what I mean his like, livelihood yeah. going down yeah going down but he had a bunch of pigs right <laughs> if he had if I all don't know anything about pigs yeah farming, but if he so had that's good or bad if he had no pigs and even when he left his kids he said to his son hey kill a chicken if you have to oh they have chickens like what I don't understand why he needs a thousand well, bucks why else he left, <laughs> he left his kid couldn't have been more than ten <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I don't know I, I, I see it totally differently I thought and if anything I thought people were remarking when we watched it as to how how much they were overdoing that like him wrestling with a pig I disagree with what they were saying I disagree with what they were saying too but to me it was like just enough because it was like okay you've got a guy he's clearly older his kids are kids and he's a terrible pig farmer how do I know that because he's rolling around in the mud and falling over I think that is that what happens to pig farmers I don't know what happens I I mean (laughs) you know what I mean I don't know enough about pig farming either to know that he's terrible he seemed inept at it he He looked like he was having a tough time he looked like an older guy having a tough time and I thought how many how many scenes are there with with having a tough time with pigs just one but that's all you need I thought that no really you think he needs to no no you have to see him struggle I agree with you. I totally agree with Brian on this. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, when, when I'm teaching, a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the three little pigs and I'll say, you know, here's the interesting thing about that story is the three little pigs is really the story of one pig. It's a story about the pig who built the house of bricks. But you have to tell those first two pigs in order to understand the context. Like the moral. The, the, right. The otherwise, the otherwise, a house, a, a pig builds a house and a wolf can't blow it down. It's not a story. And I feel like I didn't get the first two pigs <laughs> when I was watching this movie. Right. Here's the, here, like, for instance, let's take, let's, take, uh, let's take Finding Nemo, for instance. A, kid, a dad is, uh, is going to be, a good dad, is going to be protective 
of, of his child, right? Why is this dad protective the way he's protective? That's set up. Oh, his whole family was killed. We see all of that. His wife was killed. We see all of that. So they tried it without that. They made a version of the movie without that and flashed back as the movie went on, and nobody liked that character. Nobody liked Marlon. They thought he was too, like, clingy, and why doesn't he let his kid go, and blah, 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 blah. And then when they put that at the beginning, all of a sudden they were like, they had a movie. Mm -hmm. And I feel like... I feel like what happens now in movies is people forget this part now, the, the first act that tells people why to care, and I didn't care what happened because I didn't understand why a guy who promised his wife that he wouldn't do this anymore was doing it. I felt like he needed to be pulled in, and I needed to see that happen, and falling down chasing a pig, like... There was no refusal of the call. Yeah, yeah. there was no refusal of the call. Do you think... Well, that they didn't do that on purpose were like this guy's a killer and this is his nature and this is what he does and so it, maybe it was easy for him I to think that's to I think that's true too and his excuse was the kids I think the fact that we're having this discussion shows that it was a weak first act Fair that enough. we wouldn't have Fair to have enough. this discussion well on that note let's take a break and hear a word from our sponsors Scarecrow Video is one of the largest independent video stores in the country, located in Seattle's beautiful University District. One of the last remaining brick-and-mortar stores featuring DVDs, VHS, Laserdisc, and Blu-ray. If you can't find a movie at Scarecrow, it hasn't been filmed yet. For more info, visit ScarecrowVideo.com. Located in a converted dentist's office, the Grand Illusion is Seattle's classiest, weirdest, and completely volunteer-operated cinema, screening the world's finest art house, foreign, and revival films. Located in the University District, right across from the Jack in the Box. For more info, visit GrandIllusionCinema.org. Jesus, I'm so thirsty. Slim! Slim, give me... Give me some water, please. Please, Slim. I'm bleeding, Slim. Give him a drink of water, God damn it! Give me a drink of water, would you, Slim? Will you give him a drink of water, for Christ's sake? We ain't gonna shoot. You perceive violence in the Old West and killing in the Old West as an outlaw killed a guy. Or they're called outlaws. Even the and terminology just, we they use. Once get shot, it's done. Right. There's but, no aftermath. But the like whole in, in any action film, even. Right. Um, well, that's oh. new, I think. I don't think that was true in the 50s, or it was true. I think that the best movies, there was always a... Um, there, was, there were consequences for killing people. Right, uh, always, right. Yeah, but, well, I mean, but I think, really, we don't think of... I don't know. Like, we don't but think it was of always Billy, quick. Do you think it was Billy always, the Kid... Yeah, it was always, it was always there, there was an emotional consequence, but I think there was... You didn't see a slow, painful death. Right, right. Like, oh, that's true. And I do remember when I saw this movie 20 years ago that that scene that you're describing where... Clint has basically wounded this guy. Oh, I guy, think that that's... Yeah, that's... And he feels, like, this remorse for, like... It's uh, horrible. Oh, it's like if like, you've wounded a bug as a child and you're watching it yeah, die, but, yeah. you know, it's a person. No, right. yeah, I, I, I'm down with that. And it's, it's, it's just... Yeah. I think that is... I mean, yeah, we're talking context again, but for a West... I mean, if you think of... Like I say, think of Billy the Kid, think of Jesse James. People don't think of those people as murderers. They think of them as outlaws. They think of them as right. rebels. They're, they're legends. Right. They're ex- legends, it's, it's precisely. All, it's marketing. Right, right. But, but they, they, were, were, they did terrible things. And William Money did terrible things. Killer of women and children. Right. And I think that, I don't know, that to me is what I think the movie is gets crossed up very powerfully right yeah there's this idea that I guess that violence has its consequences you know that violence takes its toll on the people who who are who commit that violence I think it takes a toll on your soul a little bit I think that's in there that moment where he shoots the where he wounds the cowboy in the valley yeah he does a thing in there that I think like most actors like like I think only good actors do people who because because we were with some folks who were saying like they thought he was just not that good and no he was pretty good yeah. yeah and there's that moment where he's sitting there and he's like he knows what he's done he's wounded this guy he hoped he'd had a clean shot at him right he'd hoped he'd just taken him out with one shot and now this guy's lying there and just feels, bleeding feels out guilty about it. right he feels guilty about it he does this thing where he picks up these pebbles in his hand and he's like kind of pitching them against the rock in front while he's listening right to this guy like oh, I want some water and, and he's and, you know he's just like get him some water but that bit where he's got those stones in his hand and he's just kind of pitching it's that 
It's very introspective little... No, it's not. It's nice. a very externalized... Right, for a guy... It's, it's just of, very yeah, real. Like, yeah. yeah. Everybody, and, you, when you're awkward, you fidget with something. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Very relatable. And that, to me, is like, no, that, that's a good actor that does no, that stuff was like good. that. That was good, yeah. We've talked about this before. We talked about it in the husbands and wives uh, discussion about, like, is Woody Allen really just... Is he a good actor, or is he just being Woody Allen? And the, the, you can make certainly make this argument, too, here, because it's not... You're never going to... Outside of paint your wagon, where Clint was <laughs> singing in a musical, you're not going to see him really doing a lot of... You know, all right, okay, I take this back, because he's also in Every Which Way But Loose, where it's a, which is a comedy. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but no, he's, he is. He's, he's kind of a one-note guy. I, I want to talk about Gene Hackman. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 First of all, okay, Gene Hackman is... Uh, he's always good. He, everybody knows Gene Hackman's a good actor, but he doesn't get the uh, accolades of some actors that are a little bit more showy. You know, like Pacino can be really showy, and people no. go, wow, really? yeah. <laughs> no, no. He never no. plays those parts that will get him the Oscar, like, I'm the gay guy, right. the cripple guy, right. the retarded guy. Uh, yeah. He's like the guy. Right, and he's, he's, a, he's a, he plays. He's so good at playing a regular guy. Yeah, and his when he gives when he's talking about how gunfights really work and all that stuff, right. and he's talking about the duck. The duck that death. scene is fantastic. It's amazing, and scene. and it's so natural. It's like, are you making this up as you go along? It yeah. feels like that. He's so good at that, and I, he's. I think what he's really good at in this, well, in this movie, but in a lot of his stuff, but particularly in this. He goes from like being this really charming son of a bitch in one, and then the next moment he's just well, kicking your ass. He's not playing it as a villain. No, that's what I love right, about it. He's right. playing it as this yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. His motivation yeah. is yeah. I'm trying to build this house right. and I'm trying to keep law and order in this town. Yeah. Yeah. Which again, I'm sorry to bring it back to theme, but that's a pro- that's almost like the good guy protagonist. Sort of motivation really in most is. movies. Like he is but, the well, he's not guy, a good guy. We're telling telling it from Clint Eastwood. Right. I mean, like I say, the the traditional roles of villain and hero seem somewhat reversed. Although, it's, like I said, it's a gray area. He's not. I don't think he's a good guy. He definitely like. I mean, he uses violence to attain what he wants. Um, but he but has I, to, right? Not necessarily. But, necessarily. He didn't but it's to. always sort of for the greater good of the community. Right. 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 His the, motivation the is he makes are to right. Hopefully, not cause more problems. Than right. His motivation not. is somewhat. I mean, ostensibly noble, but the way he carries it out is like ferociously violent but um, that's what I I mean just going back to the performance that's what I love about it is he's just playing it as um, this is my character this is what I want and this is how I'm going to get it and I'm, the means are what make him somewhat villainous what why do you think why do you think like when the prostitutes are like are you going to whip this guy you know and then he says no they can you know give you a pony or whatever it was why, why do you think he didn't Whip those guys. What? It, what? Because I think it. It. They didn't address the theme there. It felt to me like he went, ah, these guys are just having fun, whatever, blah 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 blah. But if the theme is about violence, maybe uh, creating more violence, I can see a guy going, that's not going to cause, that's not going to help. I know you think that's going to help, right? But that's just going to cause more. Well, I, I think his right? thing was. Well, it, it, it seemed like it was a bigger sacrifice. Like, yeah, these guys could take a beating and, and go on with their lives. Or they're really going to pay for this crime by, like, giving up horses and giving up money. And really right. paying out of their pocket. But that doesn't seem like it's thematically... I see what you're saying. You're saying that's inconsistent with my sort of thesis that he's the guy that uses violence as a means to get what he wants. Right. And yet, in this circumstance, he's just basically talking about property rights and things like that. Right. Now, that makes sense. I, I think that's sound. What you're saying that totally makes sense. So here's the thing that I think is interesting because I, I watched it and I was like, okay, he was, he was good in it. The way you talk about it, it does make me kind of reevaluate that because it's like, well, the guy, he does, he does not want to showboat. The line you said that you remember, that's the one I've always remembered for all of, the, all of these yeah. years. It's just, I was building a house, <laughs> which is such, just the most brilliant, like, thing to say before you died. Yeah. That's like, like I don't know why. It's so 
it's so good and it's like it's just such a okay I wasn't expecting that on one front and yeah. and on another it's just like that's he's saying I'm trying to I'm building something I'm doing right. something well, this isn't right I shouldn't die now well, and, and yeah. there is something I mean there's that that John Lennon thing where you know he says that, that life is what happens when you make other when you're making other plans but death is also what happens when you're making other plans exactly. and yeah. when one of my best friends died at his funeral he was finally like sort of reconciling with his ex-wife and they were becoming friends and at his funeral like we were putting him in the ground and his ex-wife said we were supposed to go to the movies today like the idea that you would have plans yeah right, right. boom yeah. Yeah. Well, just, yeah. uh, even if those plans are somewhat mundane that gives it so much gra- oh, yeah. 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 gravitas even more even more, yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. Even if you were to say I was supposed to be president <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever but, right. but, so I don't um, know maybe this is something we can sort of see that maybe the the script isn't like I don't know. To me, it's like those those things. Is like it's a, it, the details are maybe more impressive than the structure. Is that fair to say? Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Like the details to me are very rich in this theme, and it's very kind of like it's very well drawn. But well, it's uh, it's uh, one of my favorite quotes about about uh, writing a story is that it's it's not the it's it's the it's not the pearls that make the necklace. It's the string, and I feel like. Unforgiven is a lot of very beautiful pearls. Wow, what a beautiful pearl. Wow, what a beautiful pearl. But it doesn't make a necklace. That's the way I feel about it. But there are beautiful pearls in it. And I feel like that's normal now. Beautiful pearls. It's a lot of scenes that people put together and they go, well, if you put a lot of scenes together, it will make a good movie. It's like, not really. It makes a lot of good scenes and people talk about the scenes. Yeah. It's like it's a piece. Yeah. yeah. But at least yeah. these beautiful pearls are like, I don't know. I mean, I'm, they're I, gorgeous. I, I think that's a brilliant <laughs> analogy, but they're also of the same type. They might not string together. Do you see what I'm saying? This movie, like a Tarantino movie, is sometimes I'm, I'm thinking of that too. It's like, oh, wow, that dialogue's great in that scene, and it's really interesting. The but cool. it doesn't it yeah. doesn't relate to this, this pearl or that pearl. <laughs> right. This movie, the pearls relate, maybe. Come on. Like, the theme they're is the same kinda, size. Well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> the theme is consistent. I think the theme is consistent. I don't know if the theme is consistent. I don't either. Really. I think the whole no, thing is about uh, the mythology. Th- but that's, the thing. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is I feel like there's dashes of a bunch of But that just things. makes it... I don't think it's it's just you. I think you're talking about it in the in the sort of way of uh, these other things are distracting. Like, and I don't want to know what it's about. I think it knows what it's about. It's about the mythology of the world. I disagree because I think these because other, having watched the the behind the scenes stuff. Oh, that's they, the behind the scenes. Okay, sorry. Oh, oh, oh! Now being out of context is bad. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, no, it was made by. Who, I, finish your point. No, behind the scenes stuff. Every person in there was like. Yeah, it wasn't really supposed to be about violence, but it became that as we were making it. And it's like, that's never like a really... Okay, but Casablanca, how many rewrites did that have? How many times did that change in the making? Many times. Still a classic movie, right? So I don't think... Better writers. (laughs) But we can't judge the movie based on like what it became. You know, as to what it was when it was, you know... But doesn't all... intent mean something? Yeah, it does mean something, but I think for the purposes of talking about... We're talking about a finished product, right? What, what, what do you think it's about? I think it's about the mythology of the West. What about, the, what about the mythology I think it's the saying the mythology of the West that you know is not true, and the mythology of the West at the time was, um, was not... I mean, it's about truth and lies. So why is it necessary... If that's the theme, mm-hmm. why is it necessary that this guy get pulled back into a life? Because that's violence? just the vehicle to tell that story. I think that's no, 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 no that's unfocused. You, you, you don't. You, if that's your theme, then your vehicle in should be that. I wonder if it's about being true to your own nature. I felt like he was living a false life. That was that was actually another one I wanted. <laughs> to like say. he was living a false life, being married having the children not being who he was and as soon as he had the opportunity to go out and be the gunslinger the murderer again he did it and it, 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 it he, he fought it along the way but then at the end he just massacred everybody and, and he didn't have to that sounds like hey that would be great to know in the first act like that sounds like what is missing for me and I think like there is a certain amount of suspense that they almost can kind of coast on because it's like, well, we know he's Clint Eastwood, so we know he's going to eventually, like, do some ass kicking. He's going to die. Yeah. And so it's the same thing. When is he going to be? When is he going to turn into this guy? Right? It's the same thing. It's like, but make me feel like 
Oh, was he? No, he didn't do it there. Like it's, yeah, 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 you know. in this movie, it seemed like because you you were kind of playing like, oh, okay, he's the hero and he's the good guy, and yeah, he shot that guy, but he felt bad about it. And he wanted to give him water, mm-hmm. but then at the end, oh, you're gonna be so good, you're gonna let these guys live. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna be a better man. You're not gonna do it for the money. And it's like, no, you killed them all. Okay, that seemed more true to who he is. Mm-hmm. But that's what I was gonna say. Is it like that makes me go like, so what was the point of all of this? Yeah, is the if you can't run away from who you are, which I think is a great theme. It is. Mm-hmm. That's a fantastic theme, and I think it's a. But then I want to see that struggle more in the beginning. Yeah. Twenty years ago, Unforgiven won. Best picture, best director, best supporting actor, and best editing. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Has did it deserve that? Has it stood the test of time? Um, I think it would probably get some of those things again if it came out tomorrow. You know? Well, you're you're a syndicate member. Yeah. Do you think you'll be writing its name down as a nominee? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm gonna have to look at everything. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Uh, I I Gene Hackman for sure. Yep. And uh, probably uh, art direction, costume, and makeup, uh, which I thought were amazing. Yeah. I think it's probably just as good a movie now as it was. I don't think it's lost anything. Right. Uh, but I was sort of 50, like right in the middle then, and I'm right in the middle now. Like, right. So if people yeah. like it, I go, yeah, okay. And if people hate it, I go, yeah, all right. Right. If they made that movie today, it wouldn't be any different. No, it wouldn't be any different. It would have probably been the same actors. Probably. Even, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> your closing thoughts? Um, I think, honestly, I think the movie stood the test of time. I think... Again, I feel like every Western that's been made feels like a bum note. I thought this was the bookend to the American Western. I think I think everything that's been done since has been very heavily stylized. You know, I enjoyed it more this last time I saw it more than I've ever enjoyed it. I think Clint is a high contender for best actor. You know, it's funny on screenplay, I think thematically it's a very rich film, but whether or not the story is as lean as it could be. So I'm, I'm kind of torn there. I don't know. I, I would like to see Clint get it I, th- I still think that's his best performance and I think it's an under you know underrated performance Gene Hackman I think we could all agree on he's just some kind of crazy genius he's, yeah. he's Gene Hackman yeah. he's oh so, so I have a fun fact about Gene Hackman alright Gene Hackman was the first choice for Mike Brady Brady <laughs> oh I do know that right yeah. and the studio said no yeah cause you know which There's... I imagine was so devastating <laughs> I'm in hindsight, best horrible moment of his life ever. Oh yeah. Personally, I uh, I still like the movie. I think um, putting it a little bit more under the microscope. Microscope. Oh man. <laughs> microscope. I should just thanks. Good night. Um, hey Chris, what you think of Unforgiven? <laughs> <laughs> I still like it. Um, I do think that uh, it maybe doesn't quite hold up. To what I remember 20 years ago, um, but I still like it. I still think it's a front runner for me as mm-hmm. far as this year is concerned. I haven't seen a lot of stuff that really kind of uh, challenges it, and I am excited next month we're going to be looking at Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, mm. and uh, I'm going to plug that right now. It's going to be screening Thursday, November 1st at Seattle's Grand Illusion Cinema. And we don't have a show time for that yet, but check our website and we'll get that up there. Tickets are $8 for the general public and free to 2020 members and subscribers. I want to thank Brian McDonald for joining us today. Brian, where can people get a hold of your books? Uh, you can uh, get them on Amazon. So uh, you can get The Golden Theme. You can get uh, Invisible Ink or uh, my book Freeman. Uh, my new book should be out soon uh, called Ink Spots. Uh, you can get them all on Amazon. Okay, and you've got a great uh, blog that I would encourage serious screenwriters to look at. What's what's that? The Invisible Ink blog. If you just search for the Invisible Ink blog, you'll find it. It's a blog spot thing, so I can't remember exactly what the... <laughs> but it's an invis- the Invisible Ink blog. Invisible Ink blog. Anyway, thanks again. I want to thank... Uh co-host Danny Cork and uh, and Lee for, for joining us today. And uh, if you're a movie lover and want to support us, you can subscribe to us annually. Your annual subscription gets you into 10 of our monthly for your consideration screenings here in Seattle and a ticket to our annual ceremony in February, plus lots of other perks. It's over a $100 value for only $40. And to enroll, just visit us at 2020awards.org and look for the subscriber link. 
If you have any comments and questions about Glengarry Glen Ross, when you read it on next month's show, we'll send you a 2020 prize. You can find us at 2020awards.org, where we have a list of all of our past winners, along with some photos and video clips of our surrogates, accepting on behalf of the actual winners. On behalf of my co-host, Danny Cork, and our producer, Lee Christofferson, here at Wonderbed Studios, thanks for listening. And until next month, remember, it's never too late to start thinking about the past. <laughs>